The Lord be with you. We welcome you to worship as we commemorate the baptism of our Lord. As we gather this evening, may we rejoice in his life and death and resurrection for us. We ask everyone to fill out the cards there in your pews, and after the service, you can leave them in the plates at the entrances to the church. Before we do anything else, why don't we take a moment or two right here and greet the folks around you. Our order of service today begins with the order of matins printed in your bulletin. We're beginning on page 219 in our hymnals. So let us now rise to begin the service. Oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our intro it from Psalm 2. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. 
Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized in his name faithful in their calling as your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 43. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave, as your, I gave Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from St. Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. And we rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel, which also serves as the basis for the sermon, is written in the third chapter of St. Luke, beginning at the 15th verse. As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. 
he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. The hymn of the day is hymn 405, and you may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3. In the Pew Bible, this is found on page 1020. And I'll read again verse 22. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. And let us pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, you have made us your own in the washing of holy baptism and have placed your name upon us, connecting us to Jesus' death and resurrection so that his life would be lived in ours. We pray, dear Lord, that you would enable us to desire and to live out our lives day by day as your baptized Christians living in faith and in joy toward our Savior. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why did he do it? Why did Jesus do it? John tried to keep him from, from doing it, but Jesus was insistent. And so he was baptized by John. And uh, Luke doesn't give us a lot of detail about the baptism of Jesus itself. You find more information with Matthew's gospel. But the question, why did he do it? The short answer would be, well, he did it for us. We see that John's baptism here is one of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. People were coming to him uh, from all over Jerusalem and Judea to the Jordan River was, where John was baptizing, and John preached a powerful uh, message that uh, people are to repent and that the ax is about to be laid at the trees. When Messiah comes, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff and so bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And various people asked him, well, what should we do? And John said, well, if you have two tunics, two coats, give somebody one who has none. If you have food, share it with somebody who has none. He told the tax collectors not to take more than they should and the soldiers not to extort people. And so he was giving them some very practical ways, if you will, to live out their repentance. And again, this is what John's baptism was. It was something that people performed in repentance and obedience to show that they submitted to God's judgment and that they sought his salvation. So this was very much an action that an individual would take up for himself as he is being cut to the heart with this preaching of the law and desiring to be saved. And again, John's baptism was called a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And John's baptism is very much different than the one Jesus would institute three years later. But with all the crowds coming out to, to be baptized by John, Jesus shows up on the scene. And of course, we know the backstory, don't we? Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's the Son of God. He is the very perfect Holy One. And John understood this because, as Matthew records, when Jesus came to be baptized by him, John says, no, you should rather be baptizing me instead. And Jesus' answer was rather puzzling. It is fitting for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. When Jesus was baptized by John, it wasn't because Jesus had something to repent of. He did not. He was sinless in every way but he was identifying as he was being baptized with those he came to save, folks just like you and me. That he underwent this baptism in obedience to his heavenly Father's will. But again, even though John was baptizing, what was happening to Jesus was something different than a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In this case, it was a consecration. Jesus was being set apart to carry out his righteous uh, task of bringing about our salvation. And again, he was doing it by completely coming alongside of us, we sinners whom he came to save. And so this act here now is consecrating him, setting him aside to begin this great work. We are in the epiphany season. And epiphany means to reveal or to show forth. 
and many of the lessons, uh, the gospel lessons, will be showing how Jesus was manifested uh, in the star that shined where the Magi from the east saw it and came to worship the child Jesus in Bethlehem. It would be shown in his miracle of changing water into wine at the wedding of Cana. It would be shown in his casting out uh, demons from a possessed person. And it would even be shown here at the beginning of his ministry at his baptism. And so here, all of the crowds are wondering if John is the Savior. And John uh, is saying in 16, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. John understood he's the forerunner, that a greater one is coming. Even later down the road, when uh, Jesus was becoming more preeminent and more people were following him, some of John's disciples were complaining about this, saying they're all following Jesus. And John's reply was, he, meaning Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And part of that decreasing would be that the roles will now shift. Whereas John was the prominent forerunner, he would now recede into the background. Actually, he'd be forced to recede into the background because uh, Luke informs us here that uh, in verse 19 that Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife, that they were living together immorally, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, verse 20, added this to them all, that he locked up John in prison. And so John decreases while Jesus increases. So here is Jesus being baptized. And again, why did he do it? He had no sin to repent of. He had nothing by which he had to make the idea that, well, I'm going to amend my life and I'm going to do better now because he would be doing better always. That was him as the Son of God. But again, he's aligning with us, and this was done for us. So verse 21, when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened. And we see a rather remarkable thing take place next. Verse 22, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And so the entire Trinity here is manifested. Here you've got the Son of God in his incarnation submitting to this baptism as a consecration for his saving work that he would now embark on. And you have the Holy Spirit coming down in bodily form upon him and the Heavenly Father speaking, this, Jesus, is my Son. And so right there we have an epiphany that what we know about Jesus is nowhere close to truly understanding who he is, except as human minds can begin to try to comprehend it and as human hearts can be through faith secured in this and given confidence and joy. And so Jesus was consecrated through these waters of John's baptism for us. And we know, of course, what happened three years later, right? He went to the cross. He carried out his heavenly Father's will. He went and bore the sins of us the, and the sins of the world so that we might not have to be judged eternally. And after his resurrection, he also instituted a baptism. Not like John's. You see, many Christians today still kind of practice a baptism like John's where they wait for somebody to get older and come to a particular point of repentance and faith before they then submit to a baptism. But the baptism that Jesus would institute as he gave his so-called great commission to his disciples was go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And in this baptism that Jesus is giving to the church, this is how disciples are made. And it is not just for adults or older kids, it is for all people. Peter, as he is encouraging the crowds to be baptized, he says the promise is for you and for your children. And we see that, uh, that, the baptiz that baptism is a washing of remission of sins, yes, and a renewal in the Holy Spirit. Peter informs us that this baptism that Jesus instituted 
saves us, not because it's an external act that we are doing, like washing off dirt from a body, but it's that God is the actor, and he's giving us the pledge of a clear conscience based on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so it's, it's a remarkable thing here. The baptism Jesus instituted is different. John's baptism really was a work that we were doing to show that we had come to repentance and that we were submitting to God's will. Jesus' baptism was instituted is actually God's work in us and for us, connecting us to Christ's obedience. He kept the law perfectly for all and connecting us to his death and resurrection, as Paul writes in Romans 6. Having been baptized into Christ, we have been buried with him through baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life. And so, even though for many of us our baptism may have taken place a long time ago and getting longer every day, it still has present-day effects because it is anchored and based on the word and promise of God and on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Why did he do it? Get baptized by John? He did it for us as he identified with us and was consecrated in his saving work for us. Why did he go to the cross? Why did he do battle with our enemies of sin, death, and devil? Why did he allow himself to be crucified, died, and buried? and then to conquer death by his resurrection? Well, the short answer, he did it for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep each of your hearts and minds in true faith to life eternal, amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we continue to pray for Inez Buholtz, who is hospitalized, for Wendy Ayat and Jim Hunt, who will uh, have heart procedures uh, within the next week or so. We pray for those recovering from recent procedures, Vicki Schweigert, Lori Eggert, and Mitch Warner. We continue to pray for Mike Southworth in hospice care. We pray for strength and healing for Dorothy Anderson, Ken and Nancy Bush, and Chris Gerard. And our prayers of sympathy for the families of Shannon Huttinger, Ed Adler, Dennis Hoppe, and Lori Palm, all of whom recently passed away. At the conclusion of our prayers, we continue then with the confession and absolution. Let us rise for prayer. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we see our Savior Jesus Christ being revealed in so many ways in the scriptures, through the star that led the wise men through uh, his baptism and your pronouncing upon him that he is your beloved son, through the miracles he performed and the works and words that he did, he is revealed as indeed uh, our Savior and our Redeemer and the one who has loved the world with his own very life. And now, O oh Lord, as he was baptized by John in the Jordan River, consecrating him to the service of bringing about our redemption, so, O oh Lord, we have been baptized into Christ, where you, the Holy Trinity, has, have put your name on us and given us rich and wonderful promises. And so, O oh Lord, we pray that as we live in this life and many times face adversities, afflictions, or even anxieties, that we would look to those promises made to us and trust in that external word accomplished in Jesus for us so that we would have a secure and firm foundation upon which to stand and a true joy by which to live. Be with Inez. We pray that if she is not yet out of the hospital, she soon will be. Continue to be with her and strengthen her in body. We commend Wendy and Jim to you as they will undergo heart procedures soon. We pray, O oh Lord, your protection over them and your blessing upon those who will perform the procedures so that all will go well and they will recover quickly. We thank you that Vicki, Lori, and Mitch are recovering from their procedures. Continue to place your healing hand upon them and guide them day by day. Be with Mike as he continues in hospice care. 
and bless him, O Lord, with your presence and with your peace. And give strength to the bodies of Dorothy, Ken, Nancy, and Chris in their particular adversities. Strengthen them, O Lord, and be with them, we pray. And finally, comfort the families of Shannon, Ed, Dennis, and Lori. Be with them, O Lord, that they may see your hand at work within their lives. May know that all who have trusted in you are even now gathered in heaven before the throne of the Lamb who died and is alive forevermore. And even gather with us as they are in heaven and we on earth as we sing your praises. And so comfort those who mourn that they would not mourn without hope, but that their hope would be anchored firmly in Jesus our Redeemer, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For as much as it is our desire to receive the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us now confess our sins. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. God be merciful to you and strengthen your faith. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
Her service continues with the Nunc Dimittis, and we rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.